welcome. You're at a build up webinar. These are conversations that we hold periodically with people that we think are doing cool things, doing cool things and thinking about cool things in the digital peace building space. And here we're excited to be joined by Zach Tilton, who is a PhD candidate in evaluation at Western Michigan University, and he specializes in peace building evaluation. He has a, a bachelor's in peace building and business management from BYU Hawaii and a master's in peace studies from the University of Bradford. Zach is a returned Peace Corps volunteer. He's a Rotary Peace Fellow, and he's worked as an evaluation, primary, like primarily as an evaluation practitioner and consultant for Search for Common Ground, International Alert, the UN Foundation, World Bank, Everyday Peace Indicators, et cetera. He's currently working on a large Metascale evaluation for Medicine Sans Frontier. And he is the chair of the Digital Data and Technology Working Group for the 2022 American Evaluation Association Conference and is a North American representative of the Eval Youth Global Management Group. So that's a lot about Zach. He, um, he'll tell you himself that he's an evaluator first and AI art hobbyist second. Um, something to know about him is that he's also my spouse and we have kids, the same kids. So this is a warning that, you know, highly likely that one of them or both of them could bust into either of our rooms, but we'll be able to manage it. So Zach, why don't you say hello and add anything that I've missed? Sure, thanks, Julie. Um, I think you covered all the bases. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. And for those of you who just joined, we're working on getting the chat uh, um, back online, but you can always put questions or comments in the Q&A, and um, at least I can see that and bring that into the conversation. Um, as Julie mentioned, I'm a, um, I have to head, I'm excited to share insights with you today about generative art, AI art, but I have to headline that I'm doing so as a hobbyist, that I've been experimenting with uh, generative art for about a year now. And um, I'm by no means uh, a technologist. I am not a professional artist. Um, I'm not a computer scientist, right? So um, while I do work in peace building, it's, it's not exactly digital peace building, it's peace building evaluation. And uh, something I wanna say at the outset is that I believe that um, peace builders and evaluators have the same have something in common, which is the ability to think counterfactually, right? To imagine different alternatives in terms of outcomes for the types of programs or interventions we're working on, projects, and the outcomes in the communities that we're working in. You know, we both kind of compare what is or what has been with what could be and what and that is what I um, feel like motivates us peace builders and uh, evaluators. One of my main claims in this presentation that I'm gonna give is that generative art, uh, it's a tech that's here, that the genie's out of the bottle. And um, I believe it has the potential to help digital peace building, uh, to, to add to the toolbox of digital peace builders really in a simple way, basically to turbocharge that counterfactual thinking, to turbocharge our moral imagination and how we envision uh, and uh, create um, new worlds and different possibilities. And that's what I've been um, doing as a hobbyist. <laughs> and what we'll see today is you know, what the potential is more specifically in programmatic terms in terms of facilitating digital peace building uh, experiences. Um, but really what I believe is, is that generative art has the capacity to help digital peace builders do what we've already always done, but maybe do it a little better. Uh, it also might have the potential to help us do things that we've never done before. And um, I, before what I, my hope is of this presentation, we've tried to make it uh, as interactive as possible. We'll have some demos, we'll have some audience participation. Um, but my hope is, is that you join me in um, kind of thinking about the possibilities here. We're also gonna talk about limitations and potential for harm 
and how to uh, mitigate risk when using this technology. Um, but I really hope that you can join in. I'm glad the chat's online and um, feel free to put where you're tuning in from and uh, place any questions in the chat as we go. We might keep them in the parking lot. I might address them um, as they come, but we'll have plenty of, of discussion and Q&A time toward the end of the discussion. Is there anything else uh, that I missed, Julie, or any other housekeeping that we need to cover? Okay, should I do the Mentimeter now? Okay, bear with me here. Let me try to navigate tech. All right. So Julie is going to share a link in the chat. And um, what we'd like you to do is basically just give us a pulse check on how familiar you are with generative art, AI art, uh, again, artificial intelligence art. And I'm gonna keep this tab open just to see, give y'all a chance um, as we get any responses trickling in. And if that's if that's taking some time, I can also kind of advance in some of my slides if that makes sense. Okay, we'll come back to this. Take some time and see if you can uh, access that link and take the poll. But if you haven't seen generative art. <laughs> Here's the, here's the opening salvo across the bow. This is, these are some images that started to uh, appear in my Twitter timeline in April. These come from one of the newer models uh, called Dolly 2. So briefly, what is AI art? AI art, uh, so generative art it is not new. It's basically using any type of, um, algorithm, it could be non-digital algorithm, but an assisted uh, technology, digital or analog, to help with your art making processes. Um, I could probably provide older examples, or you could look on Wikipedia for older examples of generative art. But what we're excited about and talking about today is a specific type of generative art, which is using artificial intelligence, deep learning, neural networks to make text to image art. These are examples, some of my favorite, uh, of what were once text prompts and then used, uh, became uh, uh, artificial artwork. I'll get more into a very high level description uh, of my understanding of how the process works. But just to kind of give you an example further of, of what these look like, Here's the, the prompt is on the left. So this is what uh, the artist, uh, uh, the engineer put into as a text prompt for a model. I believe this was, um, this is actually a uh, mid journey. And we'll talk about the different platforms that are out there, but this is a photorealistic image of a Kingfisher. Here's something that's a little more abstract and artistic. And that's where I think a lot of the potential um, shines for some of this, uh, this medium. Here's one I put together uh, early on as I was experimenting. This is uh, sad Bill Murray and clown face. So um, really, I'm not going to be able to do justice to the, the range of, of possibilities here uh, with AI art, but suffice it to say that the sky is not the limit. Like you can whatever you can think or, or dream up, um, you know, you can go above and beyond to the stars. Um, and I really hope that in this taster of a webinar that you then go out and can explore a little more about AR, hopefully make some of your own. So real briefly, I am going to do, like I said, a very high level, a very poor job of explaining some of this tech. Maybe Bronca, I see that she's on the call. 
can tune in as well in the chat and disabuse me of any um, uh, misunderstandings of how this works because my my understanding is very limited again coming from a hobbyist um, and so I'll do my very best to make a simple explanation but basically um, how the type of text to image art that uh, I've been working with and that many work with it, it has a few components right this screenshot is actually from a great video explainer from Vox, uh, and I can we can share the link in the chat um, or uh, if emails, we'll share resources afterwards. But ultimately, what's happening when we're making AI art is we need to create um, various tech stacks or different components that work together. And this is a, um, a simplification of how the what that looks like, but in effect there is a process of training um, neural networks on um, thousands and thousands millions of, of images across the internet that have been tagged um, with descriptions they deep learning models are then trained on those data and develop the capacity basically to learn how to um, categorize and to recognize, to encode and decode text and images. And, and so various engineers make these models. And then what you do as a user would go into a prompt and you would write what you'd like to see via text. And then um, certain neural network models will take that text uh, and decode it and then associate it with points uh, in what we call latent space, specifically for latent diffusion. There's different types of um, um, neural networks and models you can use to make generative art. And I can share a link of the different types. In fact, when I started out last year, I used something called a generative adversarial network, which basically was like two robots fighting each other. Um, to say, you know, one robot trying to trick the other that this is a, a real image and one saying that it isn't. But for diffusion models, what we'll be talking about today, there's this thing called latent space, which is a multi-dimensional, if you can and visualize it, it's not just three-dimensional, it's multi-dimensional. And there's these clusters of concepts and tags from photos and dimensions of yellowness and um, stylistic art and images of, you know, girls on bikes or airplanes. And when you put a prompt in, the deep learning model locates in this latent space, all those, the text, um, uh, the text that you've used and uh, the modifiers that you use to, to pinpoint a, a place in this latent space. And then through reverse diffusion, create an output and reverse diffusion, let's see if my next slide, well, this explains more of the latent space, right? This again is a screenshot from a Vox video that I highly recommend watching um, that shows how if you make a combination of a banana and a snow globe from the 1960s, how the deep learning model might begin to combine these constructs. So what then happens is poor diffusion is how you take an image and put noise to it to kind of disassemble it. Diffusion models do reverse denoising, uh, and they take the learning that they've done on the past images, and from just the text, they create new images, right? So I know that that's probably a very clumsy description of what's happening. There are um, experts online on Twitter, blog posts that can go into this. There's formula and math that you can use and, and different models. I tried to give a really a basic description. At a high level, you write text and then you can create an image. There's a little bit more going on in the background and we can talk a little bit more about that. So here's some examples. Actually, let's go back to the Mentimeter and see. Uh, I'm gonna refresh this because maybe that's something on my end. Okay. So we have one person that's never heard about it. Great. Uh, we have some that have heard about it, but don't know what it means or how it works. Hopefully that's a little uh, less foggy and not more uh, foggy after my explanation. Uh, so some know about it conceptually, never tried it. Great, we'll get to try it today. 
And then we have someone who's um, involved. Oh, great, this is fantastic and experienced with AI art. Okay, so let's move on. And Julie, if you can help monitor the chat, I'll pull up the chat here just so I can see if there's any questions. Um, perfect. All right, so there are various, um, let's say, tools out there that you can use to create, do the text to image generative art. I'm going to share three of the uh, most well known or, or well used models. Um, the first is Mid Journey. Mid Journey in the past month actually passed, surpassed Fortnite for number of Discord users on their Discord channel. Uh, over or close to a million users, Discord caps you at a million. Um, and it's just pretty much done by a group of a collective of researchers and artists. It's currently in um, open beta. So you can go on and you can use it. Uh, there are premium and freemium models, um, but there's not, it's not exactly, it's a little opaque how they create the process that goes into making the the images. Dolly 2 is um, one of the most more well-known ones by OpenAI. It is in closed beta as far as I recall. So the space is really evolving. So that means that with open beta, anyone could go in and could try it out. You can request to do that. Closed beta, you have to get on a wait list and wait for that. And then Stable Diffusion just opened up. Um, they were in open beta, but they also just opened up with the kind of the hood and revealed their weights, their algorithm, their the mechanics of how they do what they do. So any, any technologists, computer scientists, hackers, or uh, tinkerers in the space can take what they have and um, fiddle with it and, and tweak that. So each of these models have different flavors, have different strengths. I'm not gonna get into them, but you can, there's a lot of folks who've commented on this and um, you can even experiment and see what that looks like. Um, so for now, um, I'd like to try something. If we could have in the chat, just a little fun exercise. I'd like for you to try to guess which one of these images is never, is of an animal that's never existed. Okay, which one can you spot the fake and just, if you think it's the red panda or the panda or the husky, just put your guess in the chat. Xander says husky, Julie says red panda. Okay, Jadrunka says husky. Maza husky, red panda. Okay, we're seeing some, some huskies and red pandas here. One Labrador, all right. So if you're still voting, I'll let you try to get that in. But the answer is that they're all fake. Sorry, this is a trick. Um, these are all generated uh, by uh, um, text to image uh, generative modeling. Uh, if you could look really closely, you could probably see some of those telltale signs. But I mean, I'm personally amazed at the potential to um, uh, create photorealistic images here. So we're about 20 minutes in. What I'd like to do is I'm gonna pause right here and see if there's any questions that anyone wants to pose at this point um, in the chat. I don't know, uh, Julie, if folks can unmute themselves, if they wanna do that, they can do that. Otherwise, um, we'll just pause. And if you have any questions or comments um, at this point, It can be about the what or the how. I might get it more into the why as well. Okay. So just to give us some breathing room, um, it doesn't look like there's any questions, but maybe there are. Um, and if you feel like you need some more time to do that, I'll stop at any point. But actually what I'd like to do is let's try it out. Let's let's actually test our hand at doing some generative modeling. 
uh, or generative art. And so I'm going to come here. Julie, can you see my screen still? Okay. Yep. Yep. Perfect. So I'm going to um, just provide a quick demo of one of these tools, which is Midjourney. I like Midjourney because it was one of the first of the larger, um, more sophisticated models that um, I was able to get access to. Last year, I was using Google Colab, which is like Google Docs, but for coders who then kind of create a tool that anyone can use and go in and tweak parameters. Midjourney is great because it's really user friendly and it takes place on Discord. Um, I think that might change some point in the future, but basically to use this tool, you create a Discord account and you go on to Midjourney and you go to their Discord uh, channel and uh, you have so many free tokens or, or credits that you can use and then you could do various uh, pricing models to um, if you like it and you want to continue with that there are other free models out there as well and i can explain those there's crayon ai stable diffusion as i mentioned that one um, you have different models but there's a free version of that as well and one where you can actually download it um, to your computer where you need um, a lot of gpu or you can use kind of the public uh, example. But Midjourney is great because um, you can use their servers uh, and it's really user friendly. So um, this is what it looks like, at least with, uh, I have a, um, a version where I don't need to um, be in public rooms. But maybe I can show you what that might look like here. Um, so let's say, let's go to newbies. Let's go to one of these rooms. Looks like we have, um, so there's all these channels that you would go to and general image generation. You can see folks in real time um, in this same thread create, you see their props and you see their images that they're making, which is kind of fun in a community space where you're creating something and other people are creating, you can respond in real time to what they're doing like it, not like it. Um, I did have the newbie. Let's see what newbies are doing. So when you first try out or get a premium or a freemium version, you'll come to one of these newbie rooms and experiment. And you'll just have this feed and you'll type um, imagine and then the prompts. We'll do that kind of in our own uh, message with the bot. But this creates an interesting dynamic uh, in terms of getting inspiration from others in real time, seeing their workflow, seeing them do variations, upscale. Um, it's it, it's fun. I enjoyed it. We're going to be working, however, um, with my my bot here so that we don't have the the noise. And I will say that um, while we're going to demo this, uh, we're going to provide opportunities and more information afterwards for how you can get involved and start doing this on your own. So what I'd like to do is to show you what this looks like by, um, actually, let's do a split screen with here, if I can, it'll let me. And I'd like to have us experiment with um, the theme for build this year's build piece. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to the conference program. And one of the first themes is exploring the, or the main theme is exploring the unseen. To make it easy, I'd like to just copy and paste some text here. Um, let's see. Okay, all right, I'm gonna put overlooked, I'm gonna put less physical, visual, physical space. I'm gonna copy this, I'm gonna put this in the prompt and I'm gonna put uh, some modifiers here. Cyberpunk, um, Octane Render, 8K, Dynamic Lighting, Cinematic lighting. I'm actually going to say movie poster. Okay, so this is really what you do. You put in your prompt, 
and then you have modifiers. And what this is called, this is called prompt engineering. And there really is an art and science to this. Uh, but then immediately you start getting outputs and you can see the noise that you start from and the reverse diffusion process happening before your eyes and your kind of status here. And what Midjourney does and various other models do is they give you uh, options. Um, some of them give you 12, some, many of them give you four, some only give you one. Um, but what this does is it helps your workflow as you're creating generative art to figure out, um, is this prompt actually doing what you want it to do and going in the direction you want? And how could we go more in that direction? So here is, we're just about done with this. Here we are. That took maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds to create our first generative art. And we're using the build piece theme of exploring the unseen. In fact, we could put exploring the unseen here. Um, yeah, let me drag this. Thanks, Julie. Um, I can also get rid of the split screen at eventually as we explore more, but I wanna be able to draw on this. So you have four thumbnails and what you can do is you can choose to make variations of any of these and you can choose to upscale or make a more detailed version of any one of these. So what I'd like to do is ask the um, attendees Put in the chat which one of these, the top left is one, the top right is two, the bottom left is three, and the bottom right is four. Which one of these would you like to see variations of? We got two, we got four. Let's see two twos, let's just go ahead and start. We can do multiple variations, but let's vary two. And let's go ahead and vary four. We can have it happening at the same time. Um, you get so many credits as a freemium kind of user. I do pay a certain amount each month for a very addictive hobby. I mean, this is really addictive when you get going. Um, I've used this uh, for some, uh, some visual tools, for some blogs that I've done for the American Evaluation Association. Um, and I've also done it just for fun. So here's version two and here's version four. Um, let's go ahead and I'll give you an example of you can even just vary those again by pressing refresh. Um, okay, I'm gonna get going on our second prompt, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to have a little more input from the attendees here. We're going to turning points here in this kind of sub theme of exploring unseen spaces. And I'm going to look for just some text here. Follow the wall, okay. Let's try follow the wall. Uh, maybe we can, let's do after the follow the wall, the burn wall. 1989. Uh, actually, let's try this. I like that, Alan. And let's do Joy of Families as well. So I'm going to include that here. Um, now, uh, for those that tuning in, what type of like stylistic modifier would you like to see this in? We could do anything. We could do a particular art style, cubism, we could do a period of time, we could do um, emotions. So if you have any modifiers that you'd like this image to kind of incorporate, just put them in the chat. I see a hopeful. So again, yes, you can go kind of the abstract noun with emotions and add multiple string of emotion, emotions. Uh, feel free to add any aesthetic uh, let's get a kind of aesthetic direction here as well. What type of style? I did. I I took kind of facilitator license to cyberpunk for this last one. What do we want this one to look like? And Mid Journey does pretty well with digital art. It's too colorful. 
Um, solar punk. Okay. Solar punk. All right. Let's do solar punk and let's see if I have anything off the top. I think we'll just go with that. That sounds good. Now, while this is going, I actually, uh, let's look up here. Which one of these, of these eight, does anyone have an idea? I'm actually going to take license and say, I want to upscale the fourth version here because the fourth version looks really cool. I want to show you what upscaling looks like. Okay. So this one's going a little more abstract. But I am starting to see images. So I'm starting to see what you know would look like a wall, but images of folks here as well. Okay, of this one, which one do we want to see variations of, do you think? Maybe the one with the people in it? I'm seeing buildings here. I'm going to vary three. So this image right now is upscaling, meaning it's taking that thumbnail that we created and it's adding more depth and detail, as you can see. If we wanted to, we could put in the prompt, we could put in highly detailed, photorealistic, uh, portrait, digital art. Um, okay, so here's our solar punk. This is actually our cyberpunk version that we upscaled. I can see the inspiration here of the solar punk because of these kind of lights in the sunset. Um, let's upscale three and while that's happening i want us to go to another theme and now for this one i want to invite um if you're still with us i want you to think about supremacy and polarization and you can maybe look at uh maybe julie can share the link to um in the chat actually i can share it right here because i'm here if you are able to navigate uh, maybe you go to the conference program theme page, take a look at the theme about supremacy and polarization. And I'm going to invite uh, kind of in a workshop mode, all of you to write your first prompt, or if it's not your first prompt, a prompt uh, for images about supremacy and polarization here. You can either copy a question from the text, you can write a prompt yourself, but there's going to be basically two components, right? either a description of what you'd like to be presented um, or you can have emotions or concepts or questions and then the second component are the modifiers the stylistic modifiers that you'd like to have i'm gonna do beta upscale redo so um if you have any questions, feel free to put in the chat. But um, what we're doing right now um, to wrap up this demo and before we get into more of a um, uh, more to the presentation and then Q and A is I'll take um, the first one, but I'll do any who put them in here. Put in the chat a prompt that has to deal with supremacy and polarization. And I'll work on one as well. Okay, we got one from Julie. Let's see if I can actually copy and paste from Zoom. Sometimes that isn't. Yes, okay, how does it affect the polarization intersect some of ways? Colorful, happy. All right, let's get some more in here because we can do this really quickly and it'd be interesting to see what, um, how they compare or contrast. Here's our upscaled kind of oil painting-esque version, solar puck ver version of After the Berlin Wall and the Joy of Families. You're seeing some like German flag colors here. That's possible that what the model is drawing from. 
the happiness with folks holding hands. If you don't like this style, you can take the prompt and retool it. Okay. All right, maybe Julie's the only one that will do. So this one's a little more um, abstract. Okay. Alaba's got knowledge on emergent challenges to peace in a digital age. Do you want any modifiers? We don't have to have stylistic modifiers. We do have a style coming, so I will stay tuned. And then after this one, I will continue to move on, but if you didn't get a chance to put your prompt in, feel free to continue to work on your prompt and we can just put it in and <laughs> style thinking. <laughs> um, I'm gonna take that as a loading bar thinking and not the style of thinking man or pensive, but, um, and if we don't get anything, feel free for others to assist a lot of, if you have any style ideas, we could crowdsource this. Theater, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put Shakes Art Nauvoo. Okay, let's do that. Art Nouveau. Dark. I like it. Mid Journey does dark really good. All right, Alan's got strategies that address polarization positive results. Alan, do you have a style you'd like to include for that? Oh, I'm seeing the dark, the dark arts being diffused already. It looks like this is gonna be cool. Okay, I like Julie's. This is fun. This is definitely colorful. It's, um, yeah, it's definitely abstract. And so you might ask, do you wanna be more literal here? High contrast. Okay, let's go high contrast. This is also kind of um, strategies just position. This is gonna be really abstract because you don't have like a description of people in it necessarily. Though we did get some images that are detailed here with just the knowledge prompt. So high contrast, let's say highly detailed. I'm gonna say 8K and it's gonna say, um, yeah, let's do that. All right, a lot of Art Nouveau, dark, interesting. Let me know if you wanna make variations on any of these or upscale them. And also uh, be, would be happy to share these uh, with you. Uh, uh, let's see, we got a V4 variation. I'm interpreting that as a variation, not an upscale, but would happy to upscale. Okay, so let's move on and um, if you have prompts, feel free to add them. We'll come back in and check these uh, variations. Uh, okay, let's do this last one. Jadranka here, and then we'll move on and come check back in. Oh no, that's not. Mid Journey does really well without any modifiers. Oops. So, There is some backend prompt engineering happening to make some of these things uh, a little more um, user friendly. That's not the case with all the models. But let's go back to this part of the presentation. I want to just do a really quick glimpse glimpse of we have about twenty minutes left of some of the possible um, digital peace building applications. Again, I haven't done a lot of the when I've come to build peace. And when I tune into webinars build up, I love to hear folks who've been using um, technology and peace building spaces and reporting back. I am not reporting from the front lines uh, from digital peace building. I'm reporting from the front lines of my couch and my laptop from, again, kind of this hobby. But I think that there's potential here. And I think that um, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are on this. But the first is more of kind of a traditional, you know, how we've used uh, visual media in the past to create different piece narratives or alternatives, right? So this is an example of 
just comic book frames that were made in mid journey. And you could use a comic book tool online to take your art and put them in and to create uh, a piece comic, a comic book about, um, yeah, all, and different alternatives uh, to a violent conflict that you might be working on and that your um, uh, communities and partners, counterparts that you're working with are involved with. So getting a little more sophisticated and leading into um, uh, maybe a play on participatory theater. Oh yes, graphic novel, excuse me. Yeah, so graphic novel is uh, probably a bit better description of that. In fact, we actually, Julie and I made a comic book version of one of these prompts um, and to make it look at old time comic book. So taking cues from participatory theater um, or participatory uh, video, this is an example, a very obscure one, of an artist who's generated um, AI art and a lot of AR and then stitched them together in kind of a Ken Burns video editing software to make these minute or two minute videos that creates a narrative, a sci-fi uh, sci um, world. It's kind of a 1970s sci-fi and it's dark and it's fun. But then what you do, what they do is they have their Twitter followers um, kind of a choose their own adventure as to how to go about um, the next prompt, the both the, informing the prompts of the next uh, video, uh, but also the narrative where the video is going. Where I think this has potential is again, thinking about um, uh, alternatives in terms of the stories that we're telling about conflict, about those communities that are emerging from um, violence and um, helping uh, communities think creatively about um, how they might go about resolving conflict or transforming conflict. Uh, one of the great things about generative art is it lowers barriers to entry, assuming that you have access to a computer, uh, internet with internet, uh, you get really great products uh, and outputs sometimes where you don't have the capability, uh, the artistic skill to do that. This is one example, it's kind of a little more playful one, thinking about uh, digital piece building that uses games. So what happens here is artists will create little monsters um, and then they will pit these little monsters that they've created up together with uh, in kind of combat battle and it's called battle prompts. And what happens is not only are the images generated uh, with AI art, but then the description of who wins is determined by uh, a neural network. And so this is actually, maybe I can even show you, uh, that's not, bear with me here. No. Come and use, put this over here. Okay. This is an example. Can everyone see this? This is an example of one of the tech stacks that um, Generative Art works on, which is uh, creating, um, using text and reading text and decoding the text and then making more text. So I have a really simple uh, text segment here about some peace journalism and reporting on digital peace building. What you could do is let's run this is with a group that you're facilitating kind of this imaginative play you could have them set up scenarios that they'd like to see happen around peace building and you could do it either through peace journalism kind of hypothetical or you could do it in other ways be playful but you could generate ai generative uh, you can collaborate with the ai here in creating um, new text uh, that can uh, accompany the art that you're doing. Okay, so finally, I think um, one of the other really strong use cases here, and then we'll turn to Q&A in the last 10 minutes, and maybe even more experimentation, is that, um, you know, you can do, just like you can do participatory video, you can do participatory um, photo language. And if you recall, photo language is not like participatory photo, uh in the sense where you're 
providing cameras and communities are taking photos and telling their own stories. But it's where communities or participants are responding to, to images already. And then they're creating language and explanations and collaborative sense making from that. So this is one example where you can go on mid journey and you can search keywords. Uh, so what I did, I searched conflict transformation. And this was a very abstract image. And you can use this as a match or a kind of a prompt uh, to guide facilitation, to, to start conversation, hard conversations about violence in communities or what peace building might look like. This is an example of an artist who um, wanted to uh, visualize some of the struggle around Black Lives Matter here in the US, police brutality. And so I think there's two modes here, which is to say you can consume the art, you can facilitate discussions where you're consuming the art and perusing that and preparing, curating that, preparing that, or you can gener generate the art with communities or uh, with um, counterparts. This is an example, one that I liked that was kind of like a checklist. Of this person wanted to see what it would look like if they had all these kind of needs met related to peace. And I thought this is a really beautiful, the image um, I think is nice. I like the whole process of seeing that this person wanted to put into this generative model um, something and to had a hope to see what this would look like. And so I think that's another fun um, way to actually explore how people are envisioning peace is they're, they're using some of these models as almost like magic eight balls or oracles. And they're saying, what would it look like? And can you help me imagine this? And you could use this in your work by developing indicators and thinking, okay, if we had indicators of peacefulness, what would the image look like? And could, could that be a starting point for conversations in our communities and town halls on webinars as well? So I'm gonna close here with just kind of a caveat and then we'll get into a conversation and then maybe the more ex exploration or experimenting. So as with any tech, um, you can use the tool for multiple purposes. And there's some, some tricky issues um, because this is such a new technology and some I just wanna flag here. There's some ethical issues around AI generative art. Real, uh, I guess the more intuitive or easy ones to talk about are um, the fact of if you use a prompt and you reference a living artist's name in your prompt, which I have done in the past, to try to approximate a style of that artist, is it ethical to create an image using that artist, that digital artist or that artist um, that has photos tagged work? And how much do you lean on that work? And how do you give proper credit to that in your process? Many folks who do this work say you have to share your prompts, but those need to be transparent. Some don't because they don't want to, if they're making money off of this art, they don't necessarily want you to reverse engineer that. There's legal issues of, of that around copyright. One that's more important for us for, to consider for digital peace building is societal bias. And that there, depending on what tool you use, it will use different models uh, of, uh, or different data, I should say. And some, some are trained on different data sets. Uh, many of the newer ones are trained on very expansive because of the, the diffusion process. They don't have to train the models on one set of data and limit it to that. They can use uh, a larger uh, data and images scraped from the internet. But what happens is you end up with images that could potentially replicate societal biases. And an example of this is when I started to create images for my uh, the evaluation conference I'm involved with, and I uh, started to make images of evaluators. And without some um, assistance, the images that were returned looked a lot like me. They um, uh, were presenting as white and male. Uh, definitely had Western um, appearance to them. And so since these models are built off of uh, the English language, they are gonna be biased to Western cultural and, and English speaking um, reference uh, that have also kind of status quo biases around gender norms, uh, even around issues with race um, and other identities. 
And so you have to be mindful of that. And, and these models are mindful of them, they're, they're tools. Some of them are in closed beta because of the risk that they could pose and reifying that harm. Uh, some have caveats, some have work that's happening on the back end to reweight and balance that, some don't. But that's something you need to be mindful of when it comes to conflict settings and creating images that draw on, um, that have been tagged with, that are associated with those uh, conflicts. So with that dominative narratives, as I started to look on mid-journey and type in conflict or peace, you start to get artists who are creating uh, images of peace that might be described in what we know as a victor's peace. So for example, there were various settings that had a particular conflict party that said they wanted to see this country defeating this other country, uh, or there was going to be a liberation of this uh, or revolution in this country. And we need to just be mindful of those narratives. And uh, as we're consuming the, the AI generated art or making their art. And finally, malicious intent and use. Um, some platforms don't allow you to put in public figures and to generate images about public figures. Midjourney does. Um, and so you, I can envision folks making politically motivated art that is um, insightful, uh, that could be uh, used to incite violence. Uh, we also know about issues with deep fakes and fooling the public into thinking that particular political leaders are making statements that they're not. So those are, I think, some challenges there. I'm gonna pause. I didn't provide enough, but we have at least five minutes to um, field some questions. I'm gonna ask for Julie's help. I'm gonna stop the share and see if there's any questions we have at this point about uh, AI art. If you, okay, we have two in the chat already. Um, and I don't, let me just, I already addressed one. Let me see if I can get it. It's, it's the one that I didn't address. And okay, this maybe isn't in the chat. This is in the Q and A. Maybe copyright concerns just be thinking of when you use these. Okay, and then the other one. Okay, so the copyright I addressed, but again, I think good practice is not to use living artists in your prompts. Um, just from an ethics, not a copyright standpoint, because it's still foggy uh, in the legal terms. How well these three that you mentioned handle the terms we used in peaceful and peaceful adjacent fields? Okay, um, so this is uh, a good question. It's from Xander, and uh, it asks how well do these different models handle these terms? I've um, I have access to all three. I've only used Midjourney for generating some. Uh, type of work, and uh, maybe I could give you an example, describe an image that I created. Maybe I can just show you if it's appropriate. I'm going to headline that this is, um, no, I won't, let me see. They handle it okay. Xander, I'm going to see if I can quickly pull this up. You're gonna see a little glimpse into my portfolio, some of the experimenting I've done. Um, actually, let me see if I can search piece. Okay, so this is an example, and this is probably of what I'm talking about. I put in, in the prompt here, using technology to build peace. Unfortunately, what I got, okay, hold on. I'm not sharing my screen. Let me back up here. Okay, so I put in a while ago using technology to build peace and and what we actually got were images of a computer, but they're images of war. And not only that, they are images of what looked like war in the Middle East, right? Uh, kind of the, the Moorish Middle Eastern um, uh, bombs over what looked like some nondescript Middle Eastern town, which is really unsettling, right? And this isn't something that I wanted to have show up from my prompt. Um, and I'm zoomed in here somehow. Okay. No, sorry. That I didn't want to have show up, right? And so I tried to make variations of that. Here are some other... Oh, and I'm really, 
Uh oh, my Firefox crashed. Okay, I had too many uh, things open. I'm gonna get out of this. So they handle it somewhat okay, but you need to be you need to use these intentionally. Some words are banned across platforms. So on OpenAI and Dolly, you can't. I tried to put violence prevention, and it said, "Uh oh, you might be not applying to our." It wouldn't actually generate an image. Uh, because of their terms of uh, reference and um, terms of use. So a lot of has one, what happens when literature is used? Uh, element of imagining seeing the unexpected factor. Okay, yeah. Um, so a lot of what I've seen for the piece, a lot of, is, I saw folks putting in um, lyrics of John Lennon uh, to try to envision what, uh, what piece would look like. Um, you can do uh, You can do text, you can do literature, you can do references to literature um you could you could put in in your modifier a child drew this in fact the tech will also allow you to take a picture of your that your child drew have that be a starting image <laughs> let's say they draw a robot and it's really kind of in the style of a child the three-year-old would draw it and then you can upscale that and have it look like a pixar robot but it still has the style that your child drew that in I don't know if that exactly answers it, but um, uh, your question here, um, but um, you know, you can really be uh, uh, creative in how you explore uh, your outputs with literature or other types of prompts. Okay, we have, we're kind of at the top of the hour. Um, I'm gonna turn it, I'm going to see if there's any other questions. Feel free to to send that our way. I'm going to invite Julie to see if there's any, um, yeah, if there's anything that she'd like to say in terms of next steps or how folks can get involved. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zach, and for all of you that were adding, you know, participating and adding in your prompts and and your questions as well, do follow up. Uh, we have continued access to Zach, so if you have further questions that do come up. We have a bit of an invitation, actually, um, which is that this is, as far as I know, the first conversation that I've seen about talking about how digital peace builders could use generative art. And we kind of want to keep the conversation going um, and keep playing around. So we actually, our hope is to set up a Discord room for us. Um, where we could continue exploring, continue playing, you know, perhaps around the build piece themes as a starting point and generate art around that. So if that's something that you are interested in, and um, I wonder if you'd mind putting your email in the chat and then we could email you, we could invite you using that email. I'll also repeat this invitation in a larger email that I send out to everyone who had signed up for this. Um, but that could be a good starting point if you want to kind of continue and play around in this playground and thinking about options of how it could be used. Awesome. I'll give a second for people to put these in and then I can save it. Great. And, wh and while those say, are, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say thanks everyone for participating, for, for providing prompts. And uh, if you'd like to have uh, copies of the images that you uh, created, um, yeah, reach out to Julie and we'll make sure that we can share those for you. We'll hope, I think the chat should be saved so we can make sure that those are getting to the, um, the prompt, the right prompt engineers. So thanks yeah. everyone. Thanks to build up as well for inviting me to the space to share a little bit of, uh, uh, a weird hobby that I have been enjoying. A weird and potentially really strategic and productive hobby that I think that, you know, we could find use cases for. So thank you, Zach, and thanks everyone for joining. All right, we'll be in touch. Bye, everyone. Thank you.